Good morning, church. What's going on? What's good? I'm using the stool. Yes, you like that? Yes. How's it going, everybody? Good on you for coming to church on New Year's Eve on a cloudy day. You got up out of bed and you did a good thing being here this morning. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Raw, uh, on staff, new here with Renew. And uh, yes, uh, in, in getting started, I, I want to say thank you to Dihan and Julie uh, for giving me and my family this opportunity to be here and to, and to be on staff. We'll see in a few minutes if that was a good decision or not. <laughs> we hope that it is. <laughs> I hope that it is. Um, forgive me for my voice. I've been fighting a, a cough and a cold all week, and so if I make a little like noise that sounds off-putting, just kind of just push it to the side. Um, but sincerely, just thank you. We, we love you guys, and we're so appreciative for the opportunity you've given us. And uh, to the rest of the staff who have welcomed us on, the team, uh, we love you all as well. We thank you guys for, for welcoming us in. And, and the volunteers and the teams that, that I've gotten to work with here, um, you guys are amazing. Seriously. What you make happen week after week, it's an awesome thing to see, and, and God's grace is so evident in your lives and, and in this church. And so, uh, so thank you. On behalf of my family, we, we just really want to express some gratitude to you all. So, are you ready to get into the Word today? Yes. Okay, let me, let me start with a question. Uh, are you New Year's resolution people? How, how, how many of you are, you made a resolution in 2017? How many of you did that? I'm talking about if you made one, like you made one. Okay, how many of you that raised your hand, you kept it? You made it all the way through? I know my son did. My son did. Didn't drink soda the whole year. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Dad did not go along with that resolution. But the boy was strong and he made it through. So sounds like not a whole lot of us are, are resolution people. And, and I understand that. I get that. I'm not really a resolution guy. Um, I, th- I think a lot of people will uh, not be a resolution type of person because... Uh, they don't know the way forward. They don't know how to start because you make a decision to do something that you've never really done before. And so you don't really have any wisdom or understanding on how to get this whole new thing that you're trying to do in your life, how to get that going. And you probably don't know anybody that's really good at that thing either. And so you end up trying to YouTube it and be like, I'll just follow somebody on YouTube. I'll find a blog or something. And that's not really helpful. You need somebody with you to do those types of things and make those types of goals. And, and so those things end up going by the wayside. But I think the, the point is that we don't know the way forward. We don't know how to make progress on, on these types of things. And so, so today, what, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to offer you the way forward. Despite uh, what your year was like, despite what 2017 looked like for you and your family, I think what I'm going to offer you today from the Word, well, it just got brighter in here. Did y'all feel that? So the Lord liked what I just said. It's like, Ying. it's going to make me hotter though. Okay. But anyway, uh, what I have to offer today, I think is going to give us a way forward. And that's kind of the, the title of today's talk. If you want, if you're into titles is the way forward, the way forward. And so as we begin, we're going to start in Matthew 11 and we're going to go into Philippians, talk about Paul for a little bit. And in the process, I'm going to, I'm going to call you to something. I'm going to call you to something. And um, as we get into it, and as we're going to jump into Matthew 11 here in a second, I'd like us to pray. So would you bow your heads with me? Father, you are so good. And I pray, Lord, that your people today, that every one of us, myself included, that we'd know that even more today. And Lord, wherever our year is ending today, that we would find your way forward. God, help us today. Challenge us where we need challenging. Encourage us where we need encouraging. And Lord, let us be different for having been here this morning. In Jesus' good name, we all said? Amen. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Here's what the scripture says. Now, again, this is just a little context. This is Jesus talking here. By this point, Jesus has done some pretty amazing things. Healed some people. He's given amazing message, uh, Sermon on the Mount. He's called disciples to himself. 
Um, in chapter 10, he, he's just uh, charged them to go out and to minister the 12. The tw- he's charged the 12 to go out and to minister. And, and then while they're doing that, he's going to continue teaching and talking uh, to different people. And, and uh, some people from uh, John the Baptizer's camp came and talked to him and, hey, are you the one that, that we've been waiting for? And, and then we get to this part where Jesus is talking and he, and he says these amazing words in chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, and here's what they say. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Any of you work this year? (laughs) And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Look at what Jesus offers us. If we would follow him, learn from him, obey him, look what he offers us. He offers us rest for our soul. Now, there's a lot of places that can offer you rest. You can go on vacation. You can go to get a massage somewhere and and get some rest for your physical body. But those places can't offer you rest for your soul. And you can come back from a lot of places that offer rest for your physical body, but don't feel rested because it didn't rest your soul. Jesus offers rest for your soul. Flies in the face of everything our culture says about Jesus, that uh, what he offers is is outdated, is uh, is pointless to our world today, and and there's there's no real reason to to dive in to want to follow anything that Jesus has to say or what the Bible has to say. What I'm asking you to do is put all those words that our culture says about what Jesus offers, put those out of your mind right now and concentrate on what Jesus himself said, that he offers rest for your soul. And he offers a yoke that is easy and light. Yoke. And we're not talking about egg yolk, right? We're talking about a yoke, what you put on animals. And some, we're not of an agrarian culture as, as Jesus was speaking to here, so we don't understand yoke. And so here's a picture of a yoke. See, there's me on the left and Sharif on the right. What you can't see is Dion with the whip off to the side. <laughs> Just kidding, Dion. You don't do that at all. I'm serious. You don't. You don't. But that, that's a yoke right there. You see that? That's a couple hundred pounds, right? Looks like it, at least to me, on these animals. These are two oxen on their necks. And as I was looking for a picture of this, you know what I noticed? You don't find a picture of two animals having a yoke in which their heads are up. Their heads are always down, like this. And I believe it's a picture of what every other way that we could live our life, what it does to us in the end. Just weighs us down, pulls us down. When off to the side, Jesus is screaming many times, saying, I offer you something better, much different than the thing that you're carrying, the thing that is weighing your life down and creating this heavy burden. You know, at the people at the time that Jesus is talking to, they were dealing with some um, religious legalism, and that was the thing that was yoking people and weighing them down. What is it for you today? See, Jesus understands something. And you can tell in the way he words this, he says, take my yoke upon you. And it's almost as if he's implying something that he knows about us that maybe we don't fully acknowledge about ourselves all the time is that you're going to be yoked to something. Or the way I'll put it up here on the screen is that you're going to be connected to something. We're not made to, to be disconnected. We're made to be connected to something. And so the myth today in, in culture is, oh, I'm my own person. Nothing affects me, and I, I make up my own decisions, and I'm autonomous, and I'm independent, and, and I just make up my own way, and nothing really influences me. I'm, I'm my own influencer. It's a, it's a myth. You're going to be influenced. You're going to be connected. You're going to be yoked by something. And Jesus is saying, man, take me on. Take me on. It's light. It's easy. You'll find rest for your soul. And see, what happens, I think, especially when we get to the end of a year, we start to look back. We start to look back at the year that maybe wasn't. 
Janet talked about it in, when she was up here praying, but different things that may have happened in your year. And we look back at the year and where it fell short, and we can get stuck there. And looking at the past and looking at the year that wasn't can become a yoke. We can get stuck there, unable to move forward, can't find a way forward because we're so stuck in the past and what happened. So hurt, so bothered, we can't move on, and we wind up with no way forward. The Apostle Paul knows a little something about moving forward from things. He knows a little something about having to overcome some difficulty in a past, in his past, and to move forward. He knows a little something about that. And so what I'd like to do is I want to take us to Philippians chapter 3, where he talks about that very thing. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 16. I'm going to read the whole thing. You can follow follow along on the screen. Verse 7, Paul speaking to Philippian church, a church that he loves, people that he loves. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not count, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind And straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. One thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, to press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What did Paul have to leave behind? What was it that Paul had to work on forgetting? I think if we can look into a little bit of Paul's life, we can see that we might be able to relate to a lot of what he had to forget. And it might help us today. So let's think about this. Paul had a pretty heavy past. He had a pretty heavy past, and we're going to look at three things that I think he had to move on from. Two for sure. The third one, I might be reading my own life into his. So we'll see. (laughs) Number one first is mistakes. Big mistakes. Who was Paul before he was this amazing apostle and writer of most in the New Testament? Who was he? Persecuted Christians, right? Killed them. Was a part of executing Christians. Do you think that might have to be something that once he came to Christ that he had to forget and move on from? Pretty big, I mean, to call it a mistake is, is way understating it, but it's a huge mistake. Can you imagine after he came to Christ, you know, he, Jesus appears to him on the road. He's blinded. He's, he's led to this man, Ananias, and, and he's healed and, and comes to faith in Christ. Can you imagine the moment that it hit him what he had done and how the temptation to stay there To stay in that mistake, to bury himself in guilt and shame for what he had done, how easy would that have been for him? You can say it. It would have been pretty easy. 
for him to stay there, correct? But by the grace of God, he comes away from that mistake. He learns, his, he learns from his mistake. And, and I'm not speaking of a, of a kind of just glossing over your mistakes like, oh, that was a mistake. Mm. No, you should repent, ask for God's forgiveness, learn from the mistake, and move on from it, mature from the mistake. But then once you've done all that, it stays in the past. And some of us, maybe you had a big mistake this year. Maybe you did something that God said, don't do that. <laughs> Maybe there were friends, family saying, I don't think this is the best decision for you, but we love you. And you ended up doing it anyway. Here's the grace of God for you. That if you come, ask for forgiveness, you repent, you turn, you learn, it can be in the past. And it can stay there. And by the grace of God, you can move forward from it. But sometimes we look back on a year that wasn't, and we look at the mistakes we've made, and we get stuck there. We don't want that to happen today, amen? amen. So mistakes. Paul had some big mistakes. Secondly, pain. First, let's talk about physical pain. Everywhere this guy goes, he's getting beat up for sharing the gospel. In fact, he's writing this letter to the Philippian church from jail, and in those days, they didn't just put you in a cell and leave you to, the, to yourself. They more than likely beat you up one or two times. So he's probably writing this letter in pain, physical pain, that he could not just get stuck there and get, you know, feeling just pity for himself and staying in that place. He had to move on from it. He also knows about psychological, emotional pain. Paul, everywhere he went, there were people turning their back on him. Even when you read his letters to Timothy, there's an appeal to Timothy to, to not leave him, to stay with him, to stay connected to him. Don't turn your back on me. You know, because everybody's looking at Paul and all the difficulty he's going through, and people are like, eh, I'm not so sure this guy is God's man. <laughs> he's going through all this pain and difficulty. I'm not so sure I want to be associated with this guy. I don't want any of that pain to rub off on me. And they're disassociating. What, what does that do to a person? The bitterness that you're tempted to, to feel, the hurt that you're tempted to feel, and to stay there, and to be mad, and to be angry, and I can't believe them, and I can't believe they did this to me, and how could they? And you just stick, and you stuck right in that place. But Paul, amazing testimony of a man who overcame that, who did exactly what he's encouraging us to do, to leave it in the past, forgetting what lies behind. So mistakes and pain. The third one, unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. I, I got to believe in Paul's humanity that here he is, Jesus himself appears to him. Jesus. Has Jesus himself ever appeared to you? I can say no for me. I haven't seen him in that kind of way. Jesus appears to this man, calls him to this great calling. He's going all over the known world, sharing the good news of who Jesus is and what he's offering, and what does he get? Pain, difficulty. I mean, his boat breaks down, he's shipwrecked, he gets bit by something, bit by some snake. I mean, all the weirdest, craziest things happen to this guy. And I got to think at least one moment in there, Paul's like, God, here I am doing all this for you. Can I get a break? Can I get something just a little bit better than the experience that I am experiencing? And you think maybe Paul in his mind was like, man, something has got to be better than this. And again, like I said, maybe I'm reading a little bit of my own story in, into this because that was me. For a few years until my family and I showed up here, that's what I was doing. There were some expectations that I had put on God. They weren't God's. They were mine. And things that I thought God owed me. It's like, hey, I'm, a, I'm in ministry, been in ministry for a while, you know, doing some good things. God, you owe me this. You owe me that this would go the way that I want. 
And then when those things don't happen, you look back at God and go, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> I thought that the expectations that I had, because, you know, I do a pretty good job of playing God sometimes, I thought that I would get those things. And the pain that I cause myself and people around me because I couldn't, couldn't get past my own made-up expectations for the life that I thought I deserved is quite a bit. And I'm not proud of it, that I allowed myself, because I didn't guard my own heart, that I allowed myself to get stuck with a yoke of unmet expectations. And I'm so ashamed of that, that I would shake my fist at God like that. And thank God, God broke into my life and transformed me and changed me, and I was able to get that yoke of unmet expectations off of me. But I'll tell you, it's a horrible place to live. Unmet expectations. What was year 2017? Were there mistakes? Was there some pain? Was there some unmet expectations that right now, even as you're sitting there, are trying to yoke you, trying to hold you back, trying to keep you from moving forward and moving into all that God has for you? And these are just a few of the things. Maybe it's something else. And so what we need to leave behind, these plus many, many others, maybe you can fill in the blank for your own life. But if we're doing the healthy thing, if we're doing the healthy thing of forgetting these things and leaving them in the past, then what are we to strain forward towards? What am I supposed to be reaching out towards? What am I to press forward for? And I think it's simply this. The way forward is a call to be a disciple of Jesus. It's simply that. To be a disciple of Jesus, to let go of the past, let go of whatever mistakes whatever pain, whatever unmet expectations, and strain forward to be his disciple, to follow him wholeheartedly. Throughout the book of Philippians, Paul exhorts the church to live out, of, live out the, the three very basic traits of what it means to be a disciple. I mean, the whole book is about living in Christ and being, having joy in Christ despite the circumstances. And these Three traits, we see these um, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, the very way Jesus called the very first disciples to himself. We can see these simple, three simple traits, and we want to look at Matthew 4, 18 through 20, and we can see these three simple traits, and we can extrapolate them out of Matthew 4, 18 through 20. It says this, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. This is the way forward to me. This is the way forward for us, is that we are called to be disciples of Jesus, and disciples of Jesus are called to relationship with three different groups of people, three different groups of people. The first one, obviously, is a relationship with Jesus, is a relationship with Jesus, not just a knowing about him or just knowing some aspects of him, some character traits about him, but actually being in relationship with him. You know what it says in John 10, 27? It says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Did you know that you can hear the voice of God, and it's not a weird thing? It's actually what you were made for. You were made to know the voice of God. To be in relationship with God, and, and a lot of times the voice of God is going to sound like what you read in the Scripture, so being really good at reading your Bible and knowing what the Scriptures say is a good place to start, but from there, you're, you can hear His voice in prayer, speaking to you, saying things like, I love you, son, I love you, daughter, giving you direction, giving you encouragement. You were made to hear His voice. The way forward starts with being a disciple and the first part of being a disciple is to be in relationship with Jesus. Secondarily, we can see here that we are called to be in relationship with others who follow Jesus. You can see when Jesus called the disciples to himself, he didn't call them isolated. 
He called them together as a group, as a family. And so the second part of being a disciple is following Jesus with other followers, with other people that call on the name of Jesus, the church. And so we do that here as a church, how? Home groups, right? Doing life together, loving one another, encouraging one another, speaking into each other's lives. How many of you got into a home group this year? Come on, raise it up. Be proud. I see you. If you weren't in one this year, we encourage you to get in one. To be a great disciple, you've got to have, be connected with other believers, with other fellow disciples. So relationship with Jesus, relationship with others who are following Jesus, and then relationship with those who don't yet follow Jesus is the third group we need to be in relationship with. This is our call to be on mission. And you know, I don't know what comes conjured up in your mind when you hear the word evangelism. Do you like that word? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to say it again and see what happens. Evangelism. Ooh, I saw you shake. Ooh, I saw that. Brother Ali, I saw you. I saw you shake. Can I simplify evangelism for us? Just making an introduction. I cannot save anybody. I cannot make anybody be a follower of Jesus. But what it is, what my job is to do is to set up an introduction. Here's who Jesus is. And what Jesus does for the, to their heart and what the Holy Spirit does in their life is between them and God. But I've got to be setting up introductions. Who is it that God has called you in 2018 to set up an introduction to Jesus? There's people all around you. It's your workplace, where you live, family. Can I give you two that we're going to be starting in 2018? The college campus and the youth. We're going to be starting campus ministry right here at West LA and at Santa Monica City College. And we're going to get our youth organized and we're going to endeavor to see more high schoolers reached with the gospel of Jesus. That's something we're doing as a church. But you, disciple of Jesus, who, who's God put around you that he might be asking you to set up an introduction for him? I'm sure there's somebody that's coming to your mind right now. The way forward, wherever 2017 is ending for you, the way forward is a call to discipleship. It's a call to discipleship. It's a call to be in relationship with Jesus. It's a call to be in relationship with other people that follow Jesus. And it's a call to be in relationship with a world that doesn't yet know him. Would you mind standing to your feet with me? You know, as we were singing earlier, the song It Is Well, I almost lost it <laughs> over here. I was this close. Because I can see where my soul was at because I allowed things that were trying to yoke me to yoke me and to pull me down and to keep me from moving forward. And the good thing about it now is I'm on the other side and God has been so good to reach into my life and transform me the way he has. And the thing that gives me hope is that my experience of allowing those things to yoke me, that I can start talking to folks like you about it and pray and hope that you will take the wisdom of not letting that happen to you and to grab hold and move forward being his disciple to concentrate first and foremost on being with him and being in his presence and being in relationship with him, to being in relationship with one another and then being in relationship with the world that is hurting. So I don't know what's been trying to yoke you. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's one of the three things that I talked about. Maybe it's something completely different. Whatever it is, I'm asking right now, we're gonna pray 
that today would be the place where you put those things down. Where in all in one motion, you leave behind the things that need to stay behind and you grab and strain towards being a disciple of Jesus. Can you do that with me right now? Would you bow your heads and pray with me?